Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. It's great to be here uh, with another great show, profiling some amazing women who are true leaders in their fields. And uh, this week, I'm going to be joined in just a moment by Linda Cohen. Uh, Linda is the Sports Center anchor. She's an NHL reporter and also host of In the Crease, um, a brand new podcast amongst other things, as you'll learn later in the, the interview. Um, later in the show, Sherry Morrison is going to be joined by artist and activist Betsy Kasanis. Betsy's doing some incredible mural work um, around the city of Philadelphia and across the country. So I'm excited for that segment as well. And as always, if you're new to the show and you want to learn more about our lineup and what we're doing and where we're going, go to womentowatch.net. That's women, the number two, watch.net, N-E-T. So now I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show, Linda Cohen. Linda, thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, great to be here, Sue. Uh, appreciate you having me. Uh, congrats on this amazing uh, show you have. It's fantastic. So many amazing women as guests. Thank you so much. It's it's the greatest thing I've ever done, I have to tell you, the most fun. And I, and I also want to mention, uh, when my son saw your name in the lineup, he was extremely excited. <laughs> yeah, you know, Sue, that's the great thing. I mean, for the women that are watching and listening, they may not know who Linda Cohn is. They're like, who's Linda Cohn? But uh, <laughs> it's just ask your kids, ask, uh, you know, people in your family that, you uh, you know, maybe are now in their 30s even, you know, they grew up with me because I've been a sports center anchor, uh, you know, now uh, into my 30th year. So I find that as the greatest compliment. I don't get insulted when people say, oh, you know, when I was in kindergarten waiting for the bus, <laughs> I used to watch you. And I'm like, that's OK. So you can tell me. It's all right. I love that. Yeah, we should so, be uh, proud. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. I love to hear that because I think women are have struggle with kind of being proud. You know, and and that's really a topic I wanted to talk to you about. But a little bit later in the show, I do when I hear that number 30, when you hear that number, what does that mean to you? I mean. You know, Sue, it's incredible. I don't really fathom the length of time that is. That's three decades and I'm not great right. at math. Uh, and I never thought because people would always ask me and I've done a bunch of these interviews approaching this milestone and now reaching it. You know, did you ever think you'd be doing uh, the same kind of work, which is in broadcasting, but more importantly, with the same company for so right. long? Yes. And I think what I'm really most proud of is the loyalty. Uh, when we talk about my career, what I'm most proud of is the loyalty and knowing that this is where I should be. Because mm -hmm. ESPN, from way back when, I mean, I got there in July of 92. ESPN started, a lot of people think it started then, but it started back in 1979. So, but when wow. I got there in July of 92, this was my dream because I'm a sports fan first. I mean, I was, I am still to a point a little bit ridiculous with my, with my craziness with the fandom, but I used to be worse, Sue. I mean, you know, <laughs> like relationships that bad. Uh, so... <laughs> Well, I want to hear about that. I want. I really want to. I want to hear. I want you to share with our viewers a little bit about the little Linda and how it all began. And you're a New Yorker, which I love. Um, tell us about the community you grew up in, the neighborhood. What was that like? Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up, Sue. Because if it wasn't for my mom and dad, this never would have happened. And I know that sounds cliche, but for me, it's fact. Uh, my mom was the one. I played hockey when I was a kid, thanks to my dad. I fell in love with the sport. Um, I was a kid with low self-esteem. I had thick glasses. Now my glasses aren't as thick, you know, thanks to <laughs> cataract surgery, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I thought well. thanks to I design. <laughs> I had it. I, my doctor told me, have it. Insurance will cover it. You can have it now. And I'm like, okay. Blah, blah, blah. And it's great because my glasses are thinner. Uh, there's the glass in it. But when I was a kid, they're very thick. I was very nearsighted. I had very low self-esteem. And sports filled that void for me. It was actually Sue's sports and music. I love mm -hmm. listening to top 40 radio, you know, pop music, 
you know, then rock music, which became classic rock uh, yeah. in this day and age, which still blows my mind because we're talking about how time flies. Right. Um, but um, my mom, you know, always said you could be anything you want. You could do anything you want. No girl was playing hockey on Long Island, but my mother found a place where girls were allowed to play with boys. Um, but you had the boys were significantly younger. So when I started playing hockey, I was 14. I loved playing goalie because I played street hockey with the boys and I was really good at it. And yes, this nearsighted girl, I could stop the puck. I could see the puck <laughs> and I because my mother got me contact lenses. So I was able to wear the mask. And I was like, wow, this gives me presence, right? This, and I picked a position where I was dependent on. So this is an important aspect that I always talk, talk to young people about when I do speaking engagements, is that if it wasn't for hockey, I don't know if I would have bloomed the way I have in the field that I am today, because it prepared me for all the whispers. And the people are like, well, why is that girl playing with my son hockey? And she could be babysitting my kid. Oh well, my you know, God. Kids, right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, you know, and, and, but I, I blocked it out. Right. Hmm. And that prepared me to block out the noise and block out critics in the field that I obviously have done for the last 30 plus years. If you count on all the other um, stages and places that I worked before I got to ESPN, where yeah. people can understand how can a woman, you know, give me sports, do sports and know as much as she does about sports. And at the same time, loves it. You know, yeah. and I do. Yeah. And that's, I think, been the secret for me, because I it's not just a stepping stone and never has been, Sue, for me to do something else. It's always where and what I wanted to do. OK, tell me where and this might just be genetics from your family. It might just be Long Island. You know, there's a characteristic of it being a tough place. And when when you were hearing those whispers and i'm sure especially back then there were people questioning you know this girl playing hockey yeah. your um your confidence why were you not intimidated by the naysayers yeah i mean i had my moments but again the support of my parents who really gave a you know what and 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 saw that i was you know i was on a different mission a different journey and they also recognized and noticed and i tell young parents this all the time really look at your kids, really listen to your kids. My mm -hmm. parents knew this was something very important to me that I wanted to succeed. That would bring me out of my shell. I was a very shy kid, as I touched on earlier, um, you know, to a fault at times. And I grew up in a middle class uh, situation. You know, I, I, it's not like I was lived an awful life, you know, where, oh my God, I was just, you know, it was awful. I, I mean, I played tennis first. Yeah. Yeah. I why hockey? Played tennis in the 70s. And yeah. I was really good at it, but I fell in love with hockey. I mean, I had a couple of uh, teaching tennis pros tell my mom that, you know, if Linda sticks to this at the age of 12, if Linda sticks to this, you might got something, you may have something here. And of course, by 14, I was all hockey all the time and played tennis only recreationally. Why ice hockey, Linda? Where did the love of, I mean, as you said, there's so many sports you could have picked or been drawn to. Yeah, you know, it's just my dad. He's a big Rangers fan. I mean, he loved the football giants as well. And I couldn't play in the NFL, obviously, or couldn't play football at that time. But when my mother found a place that accepted girls to play with boys, and there were no girls leagues, let me be clear. We're talking right. about mid-70s, 75, 1976. Um, it, there was nothing. There was only yeah. boys hockey leagues on Long Island. I mean, I didn't live in Canada, although I dreamed, Sue, about living in Canada, going to college in Canada, McGill University, or even staying in the States and going to Boston University. Knowing women's hockey was so huge. But thank the Lord, I mean, I found Oswego State, which had a girls hockey team. And I, for the first time, was able to play with girls. But I don't know. I love the excitement. I love sitting with my dad watching Ranger games, playoff games. The sport was just so exciting to me, you know, compared to basketball. I mean, I love football, like I mentioned, but hockey seemed doable for me. And again, playing street hockey with the boys and being a goalie, I, I was good. And so that you had a lot to do with a reputation. Too. You must have had a reputation throughout, you know, the, the neighborhood in the area. Oh, my God. Linda Cohn yeah. playing ice hockey with the boys. Yeah, I mean, it was fun, but you know, that's the thing. It, I didn't look at it as like, oh, I'm a girl playing with the boys. I looked at it as, you know, I want to play hockey. I want to play this sport. And I actually learned to skate, Sue, uh, with 40 pounds of goalie equipment on me, 
when my mother oh my found God. this league, you know, where I could play ice hockey, I wanted to play so bad, but then I'm like, oh, I don't know how to skate. So I learned to skate with <laughs> that extra pounds on me. And remarkably, that makes a difference because, you know, then after that, you know, and I learned and, you know, did everything and that I could. But then when I, let's say I was going public skating with my friends, no equipment. I mean, I was holding on to the side at times. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say you were flying around the, you were flying thinking, around you know, the my, my, my whole balance was off because oh, I was so used to the extra weight. Right, right. So you mentioned, you know, um, pronounce the name of the school again for me. Oswego. Oswego. Oswego State, right near Syracuse, a, a SUNY school. Uh, loved it. It had a great communication studies program. Broadcast and concentrate is what I what I you did. And there was nothing else that interests me. Uh, I love animals and being a vet, but that's eight more years of schooling. I said, no more of that. I don't care. Right, right. I do the underground. Let me. So, um, and then so also, you knew yeah, from the beginning. Team. You knew from the beginning of uh, broadcasting. Yeah. I mean, you major yeah. in communications and yeah. broadcasting. Do you feel that, you know, when you think about it, it is cliche when people say, um, you know, if you do what you're passionate about, it's never a day of work. Right. And here you are, have been 30 years at ESPN. Do you feel you have really truly followed your calling and you are where you were meant to be? Oh, I, I, I definitely think so. I never knew that I would be here at this age that I am. And I'm grateful every day for that. And, um, but I think what's really important in this run that I've had, and I was reminded of that just this past weekend, Sue, um, a couple of things I want to get to. Um, I went with my son to Tampa. We both, Dan and I both love Tom Brady, even though I grew up a Giants fan. I've always loved Tom Brady. And then when he went to Tampa, I like adopted them because, you know, the Giants messed up with my favorite quarterback, Eli Manning, and not a fan of the current quarterback, Daniel Jones, since he started and pushed out Eli Manning. Not that Daniel Jones, not that it was about him, but I'm saying all that because I think, so my son Dan's a big NFL fan and big Brady fan. So we went to Tampa and, and I saw two women who do sidelines that I've known over the years and hadn't seen in a while. And they are blessings to me because they are two reminders and they remind me of this because I have to be reminded. They both have looked up to me for years. They both got into this business, they've told me, because when they were growing up, they saw me on the screen hosting Sports Center and knew a woman in sports could do whatever they want. They saw Linda Cohn up there. And when I saw these two and got my big hugs and they, you know, Aaron Andrews and Sarah Walsh, these are just two of the women. And then when I hit that 30 year milestone, all these women, so many that I didn't even realize I impacted, reached out mm -hmm. to me on social media. And so when I look back, that to me, the two things that when I look back on this career, is that, and but first and foremost, that I was a mom through it all, that I was able to have two amazing children uh, during it and, you know, got off the treadmill that us women always get on. We don't know how to get off it of like, oh, I got to do this. Oh, well, what is this? Whoa, what's this person doing? Oh, I love that. And then I get just got off that treadmill and just stopped and had two kids and they've grown up to be two people that I'm the most proud of. So I also, when I tell young, especially young women, I say, find the time if you can, you know, to just have a family because when this job ends, whenever, mm -hmm. how old you are, you are going to be the most satisfied. It's the most important thing you can do. You know, if you can do it, have children, um, and because I look at that now and I, those are the two things that I'm really proud of over the years. You don't have grandchildren yet, do you? Not yet. My okay. kids aren't married yet. But you know what? I will embrace <laughs> that and welcome that. Yeah. Uh, I cannot wait for that, but I will let my kids do it at their time. Yes. Well, it's so true about you know, children, you know, we get to to a certain place and may, it's not always the end of a career, but and then we get to enjoy their journey, yes. you know, and, and yes. watch what they do and what they accomplish. And they must be so proud of you. How cool is it to have Linda Cohn as your mom? Yeah. You know, what's great. They never, you know, I'll tell you a few stories when, um, when my kids were younger, my two kids, my daughter, Sammy's 31. My son, Dan is 26. Um, well, back in the day when my daughter was like in middle school, maybe just entering middle school, 
Um, you know, some of uh, she she told me a story, or some of her friends told me a story. Yeah, her friends came over the house, a couple of her friends, you know, and said, "Wow, I didn't realize Sammy. I didn't realize your mom was, you know, on TV." Linda Cohn. Sammy would never ever mention that, not because she wasn't proud of me, but because she didn't want to have fake friends. Oh, and my son yeah. Dan also was that way. Mm. And you know what, though, to be honest, Sue. When I approached Sammy when she was 12 years old, seventh grade, and I said, you know, honey, how come the kids seem surprised that I'm your mom? And she explained it to me. And I'm like, okay, I get it now. Because first, my first instinct, our all first instincts is ego, right? Uh, and then we have to like put that in the corner because I thought, what, you're not proud of me? You know, type of thing. Oh, like okay. I made it about me. And then she explained it. And then it makes so much sense and it made so much sense at that time and uh yeah and that's just a, another reason why i'm so proud of that so they don't have a megaphone and they don't go on social media and they don't tag me yeah uh, you know well, that, says they, a lot, that says a lot about your kids i think that they you know weren't out there kind of bragging on right trying to get the likeness from other people because of who their mom is they wanted yeah. to build their own you know reputation personality right. friends Right. Yeah. And by the way, I, I you, you know, in all my research and interviews I've I've watched you do, I think there's very little ego. You are incredibly complimentary of others. I see and saw that over and over. And I think that's um, a really great trait if you've reached a certain level and yet you still are genuinely interested in helping the other people, you know, behind you. Are you purposeful in that, you know, especially for women? Thanks, Sue, for mentioning that. I don't know. I think it, it's always kind of come naturally. Maybe maybe it's a it's a branch of, you know, like I told you when I was growing up, low self-esteem and wanting to have conversations with people that I admire, mm. which whether it's my classmates who never talked to me because I kind of was a wallflower um, or, you know, just wanting to be, I don't know, the center of attention like they were, which I think a lot of it has to do with why I chose, as we talked about earlier, playing hockey, a girl in a boy's world there, playing goalie, a position that everything is the most important position in hockey. Is the you get center. beat up, by the way. You're just constantly beat up. And right. And you could be right. And you could be blamed for a loss or you yeah. could be a hero. And I was willing to throw the dice, but I'm just very grateful. And I know how hard it is for women. And that's why I appreciate it. I mean, again, like when we started, you know, that came naturally to compliment you on what you've created here, which is such a great stage. Well, it's so a I nice, know it's yeah. intentional. I just feel it's automatic. It's who you are. It's who yeah. you are. And yeah. it's great. Listen, we're going to go into our first break. If you're listening on 1210, stay tuned for our watch team and we will be back with Linda Cohn. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. The heat is on. In 2010, Philadelphia had a record of 55 days at or over 90 degrees. And those scorchers, they're on the rise. In fact, 10 of the 15 hottest summers occurred in the last two decades. Thank you for always trusting us to keep you informed. You're streaming and we're streaming. Get the AccuWeather forecast and severe storm alerts 24-7 on our 6ABC streaming app. Whether you're just getting started, already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true, whatever your next steps are, We'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want. Or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. 
The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. The big story on Action News tonight. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, and welcome back to the show. You're watching Women to Watch, and I'm joined by Linda Cohn, uh, 30 years with ESPN as a sportscaster, anchor, um, also NHL reporter who played the game, um, and in the crease host. And um, I wanted to find out how you got that very first job at WALK in 1981. Yeah, uh, crazy. I mean, um you know, I didn't know if I would get any job. I started out as like a, a cocktail waitress for a couple of months, dropped a tray. <laughs> we all do that. <laughs> right? And I was waiting a year. And then finally, uh, WALK Radio in Patchogue, a 50,000 watt, that's on Long Island, 50,000 watt station, uh, took me on as a reporter and a news update person. And it was great. First of all, I got to hear great music, okay? Because they were like... Um, uh, like a lot of, not really like pop music. I forgot adult contemporary. Like that's okay. what it was called, right? Yeah. Um, and then they'd have, but they'd have a strong presence in news. And I knew I had to start out at least in news because there weren't a lot of women doing any sports. Did you have to go in and actually, um, you know, other than the interview, did you have to send in a tape? Did you yeah. have to? Had okay. to send in the tape. Great, great yeah. question. Yeah, because back in the day, there was no social media, no YouTube, none of that. No. So you had to make a tape, and it was like a uh, a cassette tape for radio, right? Right. Uh, right. So uh, th- then they brought me in, and I did an audition there. And uh, but the the key there, and why that turned out to be gold for me, was um, I be- first of all, I barely made any money. I always remember this. I remember the salespeople on the radio staff. No offense to them. They'd be wa- telling me about their vacations in the Bahamas and their women walking in with fur coats. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm in the wrong field. I should have went into sales and not <laughs> on air. That's right. number one. Uh, number two, um, I volunteered because this particular radio station uh, broadcasted the New York Islander hockey games. You know, back in the day in the 80s, the Islanders were a big deal, winning all the four Stanley Cups in a row. Now, I hated the Islanders because I was a Rangers fan. But you know what? I put that hate aside because I said to the news director, I said, listen, if you pay for my gas to the Nassau Coliseum, which was an hour away, okay, there and back, I will cover the Islanders for you for no extra money, for free. Just pay me, give me 10 bucks a game. Really, that's what I did. And reason why, and this is what I always tell a lot of young people, you can't look at like, oh my God, why would I do that? You know, what's that, blah, blah, blah. You, you don't know the reason why sometimes mm. it, it just worked out. So it worked out for me because I met so many people in the business. Right. And I met one of my first mentors, and that was a guy by the name of Ed Ingalls from WCBS AM in New York City, who was basically almost at every game. He hired me to freelance and cover Met games, the U.S. Open, different things. So I kept getting better and getting more experience. In the meantime, still covering the Islanders. Um and uh, that led to, you know, every step. I started doing, working for ABC Radio. I started working for, I worked seven days a week in radio. I worked for WCBS doing sports updates on the weekend. And this was before Sports Talk Radio. And this was a big deal. And it was replayed all night. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I'd come in at two in the morning when all the games. Oh, the early, oh, that's hard. I mean, it was crazy what I did in my 20s. But But, you're in your, you must have loved it. You're in your 20s, right? So you're just excited to be doing it. Right. And I was listening to myself on the radio. You know, I did have one nightmare, though, because again, these were taped. And then, you know, you tape it and then they play it overnight. 
uh, into the morning until a, a regular a regular sportscaster came in. But my point is, uh, I, I wasn't perfect. One time I made a mistake and it was no one caught it on the overnight and it was broadcast all night. And back in the day, no social media. So they were getting phone calls. I forgot what the mistake was. But Ed Ingalls, my mentor, the sports director, WCBSAM, who hired me, really, he didn't, you know, he didn't say, oh, my God, you're fired, blah, blah, blah. It was a teaching moment. And he goes, yeah. you just got to look over your stuff once, twice, three times, sometimes five times. And you got to look for mistakes. Don't look and assume everything's right so you can get the hell home. Mm -hmm. Actively look for errors. Assume you're making a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know? And, yeah. and and I did that. And, then, and there was never an issue after that. But um, so that's what I tell people, Sue. You know, sometimes you, yeah, you just have to take that step, take a chance. May not lead to anything. Yeah, uh, not all my not all my chances led to stuff, uh, but that <laughs> one did, and that yeah. that first job was a difference. Something you have said that I think kind of goes against, particularly for seventies, eighties, um, is that most of your opportunities came from men who believed yeah. in you and saw yeah. something in you. So I, I find that really interesting um, because I said it, it goes against what is typically said. So why do you think that was the case for you? And what is it? What is your superpower? What do you think it is all these men saw in you? Was it the love of, you know, the game, so to speak? Yeah, I'll take that one first. It was my passion for the game. And it was my knowledge for the game. So the passion and the knowledge came out at the same time, I could hold conversations about any sport, any player, anything. But I wasn't a robot, I really felt emotion. Plus, mm. I was a true fan. As I mentioned earlier, mm. I'm a fan first. And I think they saw that in mm. me, that I was like them. It wasn't like I was just a woman doing sports. I was just someone who loves sports, just like them. And yeah. yes, it is true. It was several men who gave me opportunities, who believed in me. It was beginning with the, the, the head coach of my high school boys hockey team. I forgot to mention, which is one of my claims to fame, in my senior year, I made the boys hockey team in my high school, wow. um, which was to me, I was a backup goalie. I still started about eight games, but I was dressing and, you know, no locker room for the one woman, of course. So I was in the ladies room after I tried out and the head coach uh, came in and knocked on the ladies room door and I said, come in. And he said, that's how he told me I made the team. And I said, I won't let you down. Wow. That was like what came. I know that's kind of cliche now, decades later, but back then I said those four words, I won't let you down. Because I realized what a this guy's got went out on a limb. There were plenty of goalies, men that tried out for the men's hockey team. Did My they know there was a what you're covered? You've got the helmet and the pads and everything. Did the opposing team always know there was a girl in the goal? Yeah, they did okay. because of my ponytail, you know, where okay. it came around. Like I always had long hair. Okay. Um, and so they probably did. But those four words I continued to use once I got into my career. And the men that gave me opportunities hired me, put me in mm -hmm. positions that others wouldn't. And I would always say that automatically, I won't let you down. And mm -hmm. thank goodness I didn't. And uh, it's really, I'm really grateful to all those people. I mean, the late Al Meredith who put me on CBS FM radio to do news updates. Uh, you know, uh, I, I got to hear all these music. I got to meet the greatest DJs that I grew up loving when I was mm -hmm. eight years old, nine years old. Um, you know, Ed Ingalls, I mentioned, um, uh, Ted Shaker from CBS. He hired me to do radio in sports. The late Shelby Whitfield at ABC sports gave me a big break. I went to two Olympics for him. Wow. Uh, you know, John Lippman, who hired me in Seattle to, that was my first TV sports job at a CBS affiliate. Uh, I'm, you know, grateful for him forever. And then that's where uh, ESPN spotted me when I was doing sports in Seattle. You know, you mentioned knowledge. You can't just you know, so I would be a major fan, lover of sports, but I don't have any knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, I don't know, you know, other than the Eagles and the Philly sports. All right. Well, you're doing um, great this year. My God. Oh, we are. The best team in, right now, they're the best team in the NFL, I think. Oh, my God. Yay. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, but, you know, the facts, how much how much preparation and reading do you have to do before you go on air? Because not only do you need to know 
the facts and, and what you're going to be talking about, there's all this late breaking, sudden, yeah. out of the blue uh, news that happens. Yeah, that's the best part. You know, when I'm hosting Love Sports that. Center, and then when I, you know, I still host Sports Center uh, one or twice, once or twice a week, at least until hockey season starts. Um, uh, out here in LA, where I'm based now, um, that's the best part when things break and you're on the air and everything changes and it's great because you're just flying by the seat of your pants. It's an adrenaline rush. Um, how much preparation, you know, I love, I watch all week, you know, the morning shows, not news morning shows, I'll watch sports morning shows. Not because yeah. I have to, because I like to. And thank God at this stage, and it's been this way for decades, it just kind of sinks in. Um, I also enjoy, uh, I work for Sirius XM Mad Dog Sports Radio, and I host Sports Talk Radio. And that is something I prepare for the most because that, you know, you're taking callers. I'm soloing. I don't, you know, have any help, uh, you know, and you have to sound like you know what you're talking about. So if I do have preparation, I do a little more for radio. I still think radio is more challenging than TV. When I cover hockey games, my first really excitement, and I never thought I, at, the, at this stage of the game, last year when ESPN got the NHL back, I uh, had the opportunity to go between the benches and be the NHL reporter for about 10 games last year. And man, is that exciting for me who played the game, being at ice level, being between the benches. And so I was very prepared for that because I never knew when the booth would come to me. And when they do come to me, I have to be prepared. I will have a little amount of time and blah, blah, blah. It's not like when I'm anchoring where, you know, woo, you know, a little more freedom. Um, mm. So that at this stage of my career, that was really exciting to have something new uh to you know tackle yeah uh, even though it's a sport up that's i'm familiar with i still got butterflies i mean you didn't want to embarrass yourself plus there's players on one side here in front of you plus you can't get hit by the puck i mean uh, although uh, <laughs> the puck didn't find me i guess because i'm a goalie yeah. it didn't find me in that little box like at least five times oh my gosh it's I dangerous, know. It's dangerous it the really, work you do i know and it, you know thank god you know the one time it did stri struck my body it was uh, an area where, let's just say, I had a lot of padding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've been you've been called, you know, one of the most well-rounded sportscasters out there. So you don't, you know, you played hockey, so you know that inside and out. But you're covering all kinds of sports. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. I mean, I love football. I love the NFL. I mean, I, th you know, that league is just, uh, you know, it's a perfect business model. It has been for so many years. All it does is make billions. It keeps growing. Uh, it has, a, you know, an amazing female population uh, yeah. of fans, okay? As you know, you're one of them. Um, it's just, they just do it right. I think the NHL hockey is is definitely becoming that. I mean, you know, they, they get it. NFL got a tremendous head start in that. Uh, nobody's come close. I think baseball's fading. And I think the National Hockey League is climbing because of these young, mm -hmm. you know, very um, – young stars that are finally being promoted. And I think ESPN is a, is a big reason why now, because all these players were so excited. You know, I talked to a lot of them that, that the sport is back on ESPN because it's gaining new fans, especially young fans, um, you know, because ESPN is on everywhere. And plus, you know, the, all the ESPN shows, especially sports center is now uh, paying a uh, major notice again, you know, to the national hockey league and headlines and stories. So, I know I got off on a tangent there, but, That's, um, you know, soccer, soccer seems to be incredibly popular and has, uh, you, know what? Certainly are, you know, uh, in Europe and all that, I don't follow it religiously. I just think, I think you have to grow up when, you know, people ask me that, Linda, why isn't soccer important, um, you know, big in the United States. And I'm like, well, you got to grow up with some kind of emotional connection. Okay. Mm. That is what's passed down in, in the States here an emotional connection from mother to daughter, mother to son, father to son, father to daughter. Uh, that's what's passed down. Um, if you don't have that with soccer, well, you got a lot to catch up on. Uh, the game is cool. The, you know, I'm here in, in, in LA area. Obviously it's very big here. Uh, it's a great outdoor sport. You know, everyone plays in it. It's also cheap to play. You know, hockey is one of the most expensive sports. Yes. I mean, to play, I mean, equipment is no bargain. I mean, right, I ask, ask right. any hockey mom or ask anybody who plays it. Right. Um, especially if you're a goalie. My God, that equipment, you know, plus my parents an arm and a leg. Um, yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's growing. I mean, you know, it, but uh, let's face it, the major sports will all be the NFL high up, you know, and then I think, um, basketball, you know, how about maybe- NBA, I, you know, NBA yeah. is the NBA cause they know how to make person personality. I think it's boring to be there in person. Um, really? and then I'll, it's just so many timeouts. So it's so boring. Yeah, you're I right. Mean, it's many just timeouts. so boring. I, I'll tell you this. I, I don't care. I mean, this is the honor. I mean, hey, the, they're amazing athletes. You know, you can make a case they're the best athletes in the world. Okay. I think hockey players are because they do everything what the NBA players do, but they do it on skates. Okay. Yeah. End of story. Correct. Uh, but the NBA, it's the only sport where when things are the most exciting, tie game, minute to go. 30 seconds to go. Up, oh, let's stop play. Up, oh, let's call another timeout. You're, oh, you're right. Let's stop play. You're right. How about college college versus um you know the NBA? So you know college is the kind of same to me. Again, unless yeah. you have an emotional connection, you know, and, and college, you know, until you get to the tournament, which involves betting and pools and all that, nobody cares. I think you're right about the emotional connection. If your family has been devoted to a team or a sport, you're going to follow that. That's right. Um, It's it's interesting. Like New Yorkers, you're either Jets or Giants. Yes. And it's typically a family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I frown upon uh, anyone. Like I I told you, I was just in Florida with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know, I saw fans there that were like cheering Miami, the Miami Dolphins on the screen. And at a Tampa game, I'm like, you can't be both. I mean, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I, I don't know. I know it's Florida is a big state. Uh, I guess that's how they look at it. But New York's different. You didn't, you, I definitely frown upon, oh, I like them both, Mets and Yankees. Oh, I like them both. Just, <laughs> you're like, no, you're, 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 you're not a fan of either. Right. That's right. what I say. Tell me, um, you wrote your autobiography. You wrote, wrote a book and, um, you know, about breaking into the boys club. Why did you decide to do that? Yeah. Conehead and no holds barred account of breaking into the boys club. You can get it for two bucks on Amazon right now. Came out in 08, a uh, little fanfare, didn't have a big publishing outlet, didn't have any support from the worldwide leader, nothing. I just did it, you know, basically on my own. And I did that because at that time, remember it was 08, started writing it in 07. Um, there was really no social media. It was just sort of starting. And mm-hmm. I always felt I wanted to, and still do, I love connecting to the fans. And I didn't think the fans really knew about me. Mm-hmm. I wanted them to know about me and how I got to this point. Yeah. And I thought writing a, a funny look at myself and my journey and a very personal look, because it talked about you know my husband at the time, soon to be ex-husband, and I brought that into the mix, but great father of my kids. Um, and all of it was very, people were surprised I was so open. Mm. And, uh, you know, but it's it's definitely easy reading, uh, you know, um, but I, that's why I did it. I, I, I wanted fans to know who I was and I wanted to find another avenue to connect to those fans. And to share the lesson. I mean, there's such, your your life story, which is original, one of a kind, is a tremendous life lesson for young girls and women. And, you know, we only have a minute left. Tell me where you are now in your life yeah. with self-esteem and confidence. Yeah. Can you put uh, that little girl behind you? Or are you just enjoying yeah. the minute? You know what they say, Sue, you got to hug that little girl, right? You know, like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and that's what I try to do now. And, and then, and then not see negative, right. As we all get older, you know, I've struggled with that. I really have like accepting things I can't change, whether, mm. you know, body image, this, that. Also blocking out, again, blocking out the noise. You know, I'm not going to lie. There's some people like, Linda, you should retire. Not be, you know, but they do it just because they're used to seeing young women on the screen. You yeah. know, while you're still Don't doing you it. Have- you know, yet I'll see men who can barely speak. <laughs> they're well, being helped up onto the stage. Drunk over. Like, really? No, you yeah. keep going. By the way, yeah, you, first of all, don't you inside, don't you just feel like the same 20 year old girl? Yes. Don't you? Yes. You can relate to me, Sue. You yes. Know, I mean, here's the thing I can't believe how, my age. And I'm not being like, oh, you know, I do no, no. But we do wrestle with it. Like, I just have, I can't believe 
that's my age, you know, like yeah, I turn, no, we never November, will. I turn, I'll say it. I don't care. Anyone get his Google me in November. I turned 63. I'm like, God, when we were growing the beginning up, of the was, second half, it's the beginning yeah. of the second half. Right. right. And so, you know, all of that, but you know, um, I always tell people like, before I go, like, yeah, I mean, um, the one thing I do want to, uh, that I'm very excited about, um, well, first of all, besides doing the sports center, I do, in the crease is actually, we, we did do a podcast. Now we're not doing it. I it's also, they stole our title. See, there's a show a hockey highlight show on ESPN plus that I host every night called in the crease. The podcast stole that title. Now the podcast has gone away. Oh. Um, and I'm thankful because I love doing this hockey highlight show every night on ESPN plus where you see every highlight of every game. It's great. Um, but I'm very excited about a new venture that I'm going to start with my son, Dan, who mm -hmm. knows the NFL back and forward and who has very bold takes and is very smart. And we're going to do a podcast and we're going to really? start it. Yeah, we're going to start very slow scale, low scale. Are you breaking the room here with women to watch? Yeah, yeah right. I, exactly. Why not? You know, we're going to dip our toes in the water probably starting right. next week. Okay. Um, and I'm very excited about it. Not only because I'm bonding more with my son and we both love this. And we thought of the idea because what we do every time we talk um, is talk about the NFL. <laughs> and oh, like, I love it. I can't wait. I can't wait to listen. That's so all. We're going to look out of that. And uh, we're, you know, and I promise we won't compete with you, Sue. And uh, <laughs> No, this is a whole different show. You just <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. I wish we had. You're so fun and easy to talk to. And as I said, I think you're a great example. You're so generous with your words. And just keep doing what you're doing forever. Thanks. Thank you yeah. so much, Sue. Continued success for you. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks for having me. It was, it was a pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure. Stay with us for Sherry Marson with our Lifestyle Watch. She's going to be joined by Betsy Kasanis, an activist and an artist. And we'll be back. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. The heat is on. In 2010, Philadelphia had a record of 55 days at or over 90 degrees. And those scorchers, they're on the rise. In fact, 10 of the 15 hottest summers occurred in the last two decades. Thank you for always trusting us to keep you informed. You're streaming and we're streaming. Get the AccuWeather forecast and severe storm alerts 24-7 on our 6ABC streaming app. Whether you're just getting started, Already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true. Whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. The big story on Action News tonight. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome to the Lifestyle segment of Women to Watch. I'm Sherry Morrison. This week, we are going to paint the town, or the globe in this case, with Betsy Kasanis. Welcome to the show, Betsy. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation. 
Oh, I've been looking forward to this. Um, I've been looking as I go around the city and doing some research and your work is amazing. Betsy is a mural, visual and public artist and educator, community activist and organizer based in both Philadelphia and Puerto Rico. She is the director and owner of A Seed on Diamond Gallery and founder of Samia Arts Initiative, which is a grassroots initiative that uses art as a catalyst for social change to empower individuals and strengthen communities through collaborative art in underserved areas. Betsy, please tell us a little bit about your background, education, and how you got started. Well, I, I grew up in North Philadelphia. My family um, came to the States from Puerto Rico in the 60s. Um, so I, I grew up in North Philadelphia. I studied here. I went to Moore College of Art and Design where I received my degree in painting and drawing. Well, clearly you've loved the arts your entire life. You did yes. your first commission project with Network Arts of Philadelphia when you were 19 years old. I think that was right before you had your first child. And that was at a local school that that project uh, was taking place. And you started with the mural arts program in 2000. Um, yes. How many projects do you do with mural arts over overall? How many do you do in a year with other programs? You know, it's funny. Um, with mural arts, um, this year I've done about three, no, two different projects. Um, I've been working with them for a little over 20, 22 years. Um, in the last year since since the pandemic, um, since work started after the pandemic, work has been uh, just a little bit crazy. I've, I've been doing about nine to 10 murals um, within six months. Wow. You know, between June to November, I do about nine to 10 murals. And some of those murals are really like, you know, I, I did a 10 story large scale mural for the T-Mobile building in Puerto Rico. And we did that in about 24 days. So it's been really quick turnarounds and really large, large projects. Um, overall, in the summertime with Mirror Arts, I usually do about two projects. And then, you know, when I'm working during the season, um, it depends on who calls me. I have one, one project left in Philadelphia that I'm doing for Nueva Esperanza Health Center. And it's a celebration of community. Um, a celebration of, of intentionalism in, in transforming a community. Um, and then I'm doing a project in New York City, in Spanish Harlem, in, in East Harlem, um, that also um, celebrates that, that, that fusion of culture and how that, that helps in the transformation of of music of arts and forms of expression so you know it's really exciting it's really exciting to be able to to travel and to be able to do the kind of work um that we've been doing i i i can imagine that it is just surreal i i would be in i would be over my head with happiness doing something like that um the the transitions and the things the work that you do are amazing you received many awards, which include the 2022 Distinguished Alumnus Award at Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia. And then also this year, you received the Philadelphia Assembly Grantee for Artists Doing Wonderful Life-Changing Work in Philadelphia Region. And in 2008, the Leeway Foundation Transformation Award, which is awarded to women, trans and gender, non-conforming artists and cultural producers living in greater Philadelphia, who create art for social change and have done so for the past five years or more, demonstrating a long-term commitment to social change work. Plus another two dozen or so additional accolades. Um, <laughs> you've had a major impact here in Philadelphia as well as many other cities. Um, you said to me, a mural is the spark that triggers other transformative projects in a neighborhood. So how many neighborhoods do you think you have helped transform and what areas are they located? I've I've done murals all over. Um, I've done a lot of murals in in Central, North, and South America. Um, I've done a mural in in Ireland. A lot of my work is is in. I have a lot of work in Philadelphia, in the states, Buffalo, New York, um, New York City. I just finished one in West Virginia. Um, I'm I'm all over the place. I'm all over. I have working. 
in, in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, in the Dominican Republic, in Mexico, in Ecuador, in Peru, in, in Paraguay. Like I've, I've done um, just different, different uh, projects in different spaces. And the idea with the work that I've been doing with Semilla, Semilla I started in 2007, um, and it's basically activating community spaces and involving the community in the transformation. So usually my doors in the studio are open. I used to have a really large scale studio in Philly, about 2000 square feet. And, you know, we would always have the doors open and invite people in. We would have a call for volunteers and we, we work with missionary groups. We've worked with university groups um, and we've worked with young artists that have an interest in in community work, in transformative uh, work inside of, of pretty underserved communities. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, you know, the mural is always like that way, especially when, I, when I'm doing work abroad, when I'm doing work in other countries, a mural is really that first step to really get to know the community and really get to know like what's happening in the neighborhood. Because yeah. it's like really, it's a really approachable medium. I mean, people definitely feel comfortable coming up to you and talking to you about the neighborhood. Sure. You you want to you want to see what's going on. Um, the process of putting murals together is so complex. Uh, I mean, when we were talking, I had no idea uh, how it all came together, and it requires an incredible amount of organization. I, I used yeah. to make huge batches of soups and different um, food products. Mm -hmm. So I know what how that all transformed from um, the ingredients to the final product and storage and everything. Two thousand square feet for a studio does not sound like that much when you're working on the bridge on Spring Garden Street, which is a thousand feet of color and painting on both sides of the street. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how the the project and the process and how it all comes together. Yeah, so I mean, uh, murals can be done in completely different ways. Like in Philadelphia, we normally work on parachute cloth on fabric. Actually, this this painting in behind me is on fa on uh, parachute cloth. They're usually cut down in five by five foot sheets. Um, we project on. We make a digital design of the of the mural based on conversations that we've had during community meetings and with stakeholders that are involved. Um, with the Spring Garden Street Bridge, that was a little bit different because we were working on 94 uh, 5 by 10 foot corrugated aluminite panels. Um, so the process was completely different. And our mural, our, our design was really complex. That, that mural coincided with the exhibit on at the Philadelphia Museum called Paint the Revolution. And it was the artist um, from the Mexican Revolution. Mm -hmm. So when we, when I started designing, we, we started doing uh, motifs, like floral motifs. I started playing with uh, Talavera tile designs, which is the, the really beautiful uh, Mexican style designs, which, you know, when you combine them together, they create another series of patterns. Um, so, the bridge has the Philadelphia Museum of Art on one side, and on the other side, it has the Mantua community. And the Mantua community had a campaign called Bulbs Instead of Bullets. And it was a campaign against violence. And what they were doing was planting tulips all over the, all over the neighborhood. So in solidarity with their campaign, when I started designing, I created a Talavera tile design that had a whole bunch of tulips on it. Um, and then we had central images where there's tulips all over the, the design. And um, we also, that, that particular mural, I mean, if you think, you know, it's, it's 94 five by 10 foot panels. It takes up an entire uh, city block. It's bigger than an entire city block um, on both sides of the bridge. And our brushes were, you know, like, our brushes were like this little <laughs> they were tiny and some of our our layers needed you know four to seven um layers because it was such you know static pattern you know we 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 created um where we had really specific patterns it wasn't it wasn't done in in most of the mural in a painterly way it was very specific patterns that had to be repeated and solid so 
that particular mural took us about a year to paint. Mm -hmm. And there is a strip on the bottom um, that was done on fabric on parachute cloth. And it's just a continuous line of, of tulips. And that, because they were so small, they were more trans uh, transportable. They were, you could send them out to different places. We had community centers, we had folks in prison, we had teachers in different areas just going out to different spaces to help paint the bottom and that lined the very bottom. So overall, that particular um, mural on the Spring Garden Street Bridge had over 6,000 tulips. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. And so great that it, you got so many different people involved in all different areas and um, positions, you know, to be having prisoners help paint something like that. It must make them feel good. It just must have, you must feel so good to have people just walk in your door and want to get involved. It must be amazing. Um, I, I think I think it's a project that's that's good that's like give and take. Um, definitely, I mean, we get more out of it than than what we're putting in. I, well, I think it's like mutual. It's it's an incredible incredible um, kind of work. Yeah. In 2018, you were featured in the Rob Report as one of five women changing the face of the street art around the globe. That's an amazing thing to have um, in a magazine and and told to millions of people. Um, you shared with me a little bit about what is next. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, you have a 17 acre farm in Puerto Rico, which is, what is your future there? Well, the idea right in Philadelphia, um, after I started Semilla Arts Initiative, three years later, I started a gallery called A Seed on Diamond. And it was a gallery in North Philadelphia that showed the work of, of, diff of local artists, of artists that were visiting. The idea was to create uh, a platform for you know various communities to tell their stories. And then we had the studio space that opened up in 2014. The idea is to create a space on the farm in Puerto Rico and have uh, a living space for students for that, that are part of alternative spring breaks that come and do a week of service. We wanna have um, artists from the diaspora come link up with artists from the island. The idea is to create a space where artists and community members can have music, culture, arts, culture. I mean, we wanna play with all of it. And it's just an extension of what we started in Philadelphia. That's fantastic. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time. Betsy, I know millions of people love your work and appreciate what you do. We need more programs like this. Uh, these are the things that will help people old and young stay out of trouble and engage in good things for their neighborhoods and communities. Thank you so much for being on the show and for all Thank that you, you do. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, for more information about Betsy, her work programs, she teaches and upcoming proje projects, go to www b z c a s a n a s dot info that's b z casanis dot info sue will be right back after the break to close out the show ladies keep living your dreams thank you action news celebrating 50 years of accuweather the heat is on. In 2010, Philadelphia had a record of 55 days at or over 90 degrees. And those scorchers, they're on the rise. In fact, 10 of the 15 hottest summers occurred in the last two decades. Thank you for always trusting us to keep you informed. You're streaming and we're streaming. Get the AccuWeather forecast and severe storm alerts 24-7 on our 6ABC streaming app. Whether you're just getting started, Already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true. Whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank. Here we grow. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view. It goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want. Or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. 
The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. The big story on Action News tonight. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, and welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for joining me this week. Uh, Next week, I will be joined by Susan Martinelli Shea, and she's the founder of Dancing with the Students, which is a nonprofit that's helping students develop more self-esteem, more confidence, and just kind of stay out of trouble, as uh, Sue says. Thanks so much to Tone DeShields, our producer, Sherry Marson for the Lifestyle Watch segment, and all of our watch team members and sponsors. Have a great week, everyone. I feel it coming. We can do a summer party. <laughs> it's the weather. Can we do this show outside or on the roof? <laughs> Weekdays at 9 on 6ABC.